stock is up. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to episode two of the Shits Open podcast. We are having an emergency broadcast because there is some shit that's happened. And I have a very good friend, Tanner Wirtz, of the Tanner Time podcast and many other titles that we'll get into momentarily. And we're gonna we're gonna sort of dive into the shit, so to speak. So I cannot Tanner, wait, cannot wait cannot to get shit with you, man. Thank you for having me. And uh, shout out to uh, Mr. Zach Jacobs on your first episode for uh, mm-hmm. really keeping the bar super high. So hopefully this <laughs> isn't the last episode of Shit's Open. <laughs> Let's hope it's hopefully we don't uh, get this shit shut down because uh, typically I wanted to I wanted to steer away from talking about music. You know, because mm-hmm. for those who have not seen episode one, we're going to kind of briefly talk about the sort of goal of this podcast is just to sort of like to get guests on here, have maybe even a couple guests and have discussion panels and just sort of like break down um, kind of all the cores and facets of what make us us, you know, spiritual beliefs, political beliefs, sexuality, um, gender identity, all these things. And in, in, in an attempt to have open, honest discussions uh for one because i'm a self-admitted dumbass and i just want (laughs) to grow um and become a better listener but i think you know i want the goal i should say is uh to become a we rather than an us versus them but episode two we're going rogue because there is now a us versus them situation. And there was quite, quite a few attempts to try and get some people on this on this podcast to have a, a full panel discussion and squash some beef and squash some stuff. Uh, but they were politely declined, I think, you know, for uh, one reason or another. So um, before we dive into... <laughs> That's great, dude. Never, it's, it, I was just trying to tap the screen because I thought my phone was going to just like close itself and then I just hit the, the button right That's here. That's awesome. So Perfect. I'm just going to gonna do that for now. So Yeah, Tanner is going to be today's soundboard. So uh, before we dive into everything, though, uh, I do want to have a little bit of a precursor uh, and just say that, you know, this episode is strictly going to be based on our opinions um and outside of that we're not going to uh project anything on anyone any business or venue side or the people involved because we know all the people involved we're friends with all the people involved um the only thing that we're things that we're going to discuss about the subject matter are only things that have been public you can literally go to the interweb and view it yourself so without further ado Let's go ahead and I don't have necessarily a person working a board right now. So I'm going to have to be the one to pull up this fun stuff. But first and foremost, go ahead and share this right here. First of all, you know, tweet's going to be good when it starts with (laughs) LMAO. Right, exactly. So no matter matter what the context is. (laughs) This, This was posted on April 29th. Um, at 9 p.m. and it said, left my ass off, Holland House bought SummitShack.com, so it redirects to their Facebook page. Number one, petty. Two, I didn't know you wanted our traffic so badly, so I'm sorry uh, that y'all need it. Anyway, our new website is live at the SummitShack.com. So, <laughs> just like you, uh, after we were talking before we were started recording this, I had no idea this was a fucking thing. So essentially, I think I might might have posted a tweet after this. That was the the shot heard around the world in the local scene Twitter universe. Mm -hmm. Because nobody had known about it. At least, excuse me, from like our inner circles. What the fuck? Okay. It was just another another day on Twitter and just going through the timeline. Because one, we're in a pandemic. So like... What the fuck else are we going to do? Right, there's nothing, really nothing else to do unless you're actually working or being productive. It's like, I'm going to check Twitter and see what other people are saying or just speak my mind 
by speak my mind probably just being like yo beer sounds good or just rambling on because it's really <laughs> our twitter is really the virtual diary so that's how it's kind of treated but uh yeah probably just like the rest of the the, the scene in the region it took me by surprise uh same, oh, yeah. same as you and my you know many others so yeah right and so to give context to those who don't know uh there are essentially uh this just sounds so goofy just even talking about it but there are two <laughs> different venues one in bowling green ohio and the other in uh holland sylvania which is essentially toledo ohio um the one in uh, toledo is holland house the one in bowling green is the summit shack um both are diy venues they are <laughs> venues run out of people's essentially homes garages but their homesteads so to speak mm -hmm. and I feel like there's been a lot of unspoken I'm sure there's a lot that I don't know or you don't know or a lot of us don't know because we're not in in the shit so to speak mm -hmm. uh, but there's been a ongoing feeling for a long time and I, I'm sure as with anything in the world uh, there has been just a lot of unspoken arms race sort of competition going on. And I think that sort of stems back in as, as uh, you yourself are a graduate of the Toledo University, the mm -hmm. University of Toledo, I should say. Uh, I sound like a boomer when I say the Toledo University. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, my, uh, sometimes my parents will catch themselves and say that because when they're our age or grow, you know, growing up, that's, that's Toledo. Yeah. It was a thing, and my grandma still does that. So right, uh, but you you doubt. know very well the Battle of seventy five. You know and how extremely well deep that shit runs. You know, and I also I was in uh, I was in marching band all five years of college. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I was so I'm a, I was rocking the the fifth year, the super senior, whatever you want to call it. So like, especially when you're in band, you're just like neck deep in like the the football and the you know the athletic rivalry so like witness it all dude and especially like right. when you're the visiting team so then like you're just tra you travel down and like at the end of the day most people are respectful if anything the rivalry is literally just based off of history but you know it's just one of those things like right no so. that, that's that's typically how rivalries and it's actually as you know that's that's really funny not to cut you off but like this is like literally another version of the Battle of I seventy five. I've never, <laughs> never thought of it like that. So it's kind of hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and but like the like you were kind of pointing out, uh, a lot of rivalries are typically in good spirits because they're ultimately in in, in the special specify, you know, the Rockets versus the Falcons. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll just specify like you all are playing a game, okay? You know, like mm -hmm. like the rivalry is good. It's healthy competition. Um, obviously, you have your outlier shit talkers, you know, drunk shirtless dudes that look a lot like me, you know, with a fucking melted. <laughs> that, used it, that, that was you that one time. Yeah, <laughs> with a fucking melted rocket or something like that right here. It's going, fuck you! <laughs> I'll break your fucking legs, Logan Woodside! All right. Um... <laughs> I, I, I can just tell the uh, Bengal fan you just came out of that moment because I know exactly where you're coming from. Ugh. No, but uh, <laughs> there's there's obviously that, but you know, at the end of the day, the end game is they're playing a game. We we love the game, we're in it. The spirit of competition is fun, yada yada yada. The difference of this battle of I seventy five between Holland House and the Summit Shack is uh, there's a, a lot of weird. It's just weird, you know. I think uh, I saw somebody on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> It was just like, like mom, dad, stop fighting. <laughs> you know, like it, it kind of like it had that same energy of when, when someone check posted that tweet, it was just kind of like the, you know, dad just hit mom at the dinner table. And now we're just kind of like, what do you do? You know, oh, come there's on, like, dude. there's like no way to react. You're just kind of like, uh, uh, uh like you right. don't know what to do. So. Especially when you're like us and you're just kind of caught in the middle, you know, because I've, Literally. I've, I've played shows at both venues. Mm -hmm. I uh, am friends with people at both venues. Um, I definitely have my own thoughts on how some of these things are run, but again, they're my thoughts. There are many like it. Mm -hmm. Those ones are my own. Um, so, okay, so we have that initial tweet, have a lot of reactions. 
Like, people are going, like, what the fuck? I and mean, this shit, thing caught and the shit fire. Hit, I'll say the shit that hit the fan, like, or, excuse me, the shit opened up, like, really quickly. Oh, yeah, there you go. And then, of course, like, you know, like, in the ice, in, like, in the ice cream militia group chat, it's like, you know, and then probably so many other band group chats out there were just like, what's going on? This is, like, you know, so. Right, because and one of the biggest things I was talking about with some of my bandmates um, was like, okay, if this is going to get dirty, if this is just going to get weird and, like, even more clicky than it's already been for God knows how many years, mm-hmm. um, you know, what, what are you going to do as a musician in a band who just wants to go out and play shows and, like, share your songs, Okay. Because at the yeah. end of the at the end of the, that's literally what all these bands are trying to do. Exactly, this is what literally. we're just trying to fucking do, you know. And what's going to happen if we go play a venue, you know, and share our music and share our songs? Is there going to be a line in the sand where you played at Holland House, you're never welcoming, you know, someone check or Bowling Green affiliate again? Wait, what the fuck? I used to live in Bowling Green, you know. I know Connor, you know. I know these people, like, mm-hmm. like what? Really? Or or vice versa. If I go play a Summit Shack show, you know, am, am I going to be looked at by Toledo and going, you, what the fuck? You know, it 100%. already red flags, you know, and so there's that. It caught a lot of attention because for those who don't know and for those who do know, Summit Shack's got a pretty big following, not only just in Bowling Green in, in Northwest Ohio, they have a lot of friends because we have this crazy thing called the internet. What a concept. It's a series of tubes <laughs> where boobs and wieners are floating around. And apparently between the, the dicks and, and chest beefers, you know, there are ways to like commercialize and expand brands and get people to know about shit. And so, mm-hmm. uh, there that it gained a lot of steam lots of retweets quoted tweets all this stuff and i sound like such a fucking bro you know talking about well let's talk about tweets and retweets but no here we are but no it's, it's totally true and like um i give a lot of, i give massive credit to the summit shack guys because they've put in a ton of effort in their uh in their online presence and, absolutely uh, and like i went to I actually i went to school at ut for marketing so like and of course the big if not the biggest form of marketing right now is internet and with the internet you have social media and no matter how I hate it <laughs> it's no it's it's a it's totally a blessing and a curse and like right um a weird way to look at it is a band is kind of like a product or a brand if you want to call it and the product is we have these songs that can connect with you and right. here's the logo for you to relate with it it's like looking at a nestle pure life Logan is be like, wow, this is delicious. Like you can look at a band logo and be like, that band's dope. And the Summit Shack has been able to do that. And right. uh, you go to their profile, you can tell they just get massive reactions on everything. So big shout out to them with that. Right, um, man. Yeah. And that's and something I'd like to aspire with. Right. Kind of stuff, like. Right. And, and, and before we move forward, you know, big credit to, you know, both <clears throat> venue owners and both, people who run social media and stuff like that mm-hmm. that is well beyond my world okay like more power to everybody and what they're doing in booking shows is fucking mm-hmm. hard and and another way to look at it is both owners of both venues like i kind of put them in the public figure category because they're kind of like the ambassadors well they are the ambassadors of their venues right. and they can go out to anywhere in public and be like hey you're so-and-so from that venue and then being like, yeah, I heard you had these bands or it's like, are you looking for bands? It's like, uh, and so it's like just representing a place where music can happen. And all the, all the people who own both places are both very, are all like recognizable people and great and great guys. And it's always a pleasure seeing any of them. So, uh, right. It's just kind of one of those things. So and I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels that way. Exactly. You know, there's, there's a lot when it comes to our local scene. There's a lot of <clears throat> context with in, in people, you know, who've been with the scene, whether they're fresh or, or they've been in it for a long time. Mm-hmm. It's a very 
I want to say small community, but you know, if you look at the demographic of the fucking world or even the statewide, you know, a lot of what musicians in this area only know is like Toledo and Bowling Green. That's like the extent that they've traveled out, mm-hmm. you know? And so this shit is, is uh, pretty easy to fall into because it's going to be practically everywhere because it's one, we're here in a fucking quarantine. <laughs> you know, we ain't going anywhere. Absolutely. So should, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on with this. So I'm actually going to go ahead and there's another piece here I want to share. Um, this was posted April 30th. So, you know, just a little bit, little, little bit after the day, the day after, um, after a lot of back and forth of, you know, Holland house people versus, uh, summit shack people, a lot of, a lot of ugly, you know, borderline cyber bullying going on. And then finally, Holland House made their statement. Uh, again, this is not an opinion. This is just what was said publicly. It said, hello, back in January, we bought a URL as a lighthearted joke. Didn't expect to be tried as war criminals. We were fully prepared to hand it over. Once the link was discovered, however, the tortures and pitchforks are a little much. We've changed the URL. Have a great day. So. Heart emoji. Heart emoji, yeah. So you see that and you go, mm-hmm. okay. There's, there's still a lot of kind of intense shit going on, but it was a joke. It went bad. It's, it sounds like they're owning it. Mm-hmm. But then the shit really fucking opened up. It's oh, yeah. Ever, everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. And what happened after this was the ugh, heel turn of the fucking century of – you know, literally just scrolling on this while I'm on the shitter, you know, going like, whoa, what the fuck? They rerouted right. summitshack.com to Rick Astley's never going to give you up. I did not know that. For like a little bit. Like okay. the, the Rick Roll video? The Rick Roll video, dude. And so, oh shit. Ho- okay, <laughs> massive mixed signals here. So, like, all right, you're already posting saying, hey, you know, peace, love, like, not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a lighthearted joke. We'll go ahead and, you know, <clears throat> give it back. So when I saw it, I'm like, okay, shit's going to be kind of going down. But then they did the Rickroll thing. And then, and then it got even fucking more weird because you saw this. Somebody that works at Summer Shack said, so can we have the URL then? And Holland House responded with, do you use Venmo or Cash App? with the estimated value of summitcheck.com at, um, at $1,452. Holy shit. <laughs> like, wow. okay. You know, like, uh, that's not white flag piece. Like, hey, you know, it was a joke, no, whatever. Yeah. Like, shots wow. are being fired. And I was wondering, why the fuck are they going aggressive? You know, like, what? Did, like now you're just look, you're looking at what Summit Shack is doing and looking at Holland House. You're going, man, man, these whoever's running the Holland House accounts right now, they are wiling out. They're being fucking assholes right now. That fucking sucks. But then you go through the comments, mm-hmm. you go through some different things, and you and you realize that perhaps this came from defense mode. Because they were getting a lot of flack from Summit Shack people. And here is another piece here. There was somebody actually made a Twitter account called Holland House Rules. And there's only one post on it. And just expand this here. This is the one post on it. And it says, the Holland House is a great venue if you like drunk shirtless men with beards and six band bills where every single band may actually be a carbon copy of the previous butt rock pop punk band that had just played. If you like being shoved at every show, no matter the genre, or misgendered, really stoked for Toledo to make fun for this one, 
Uh, definitely play or attend a show at Holland House. Donate pay, donation payout is shit. Touring bands, other than the aforementioned pop punk clones, will never take this place seriously ever again. We are 100% about the scene, even though we are trying to flip the Summit Shack domain for $1,400 because of Twitter. In parentheses, we're not the petty ones, though. If you choose not to attend our venue, I promise you, you can still find us drunk and loud at any time or place in any part of Toledo. So, clearly, Ooh. this was created by a pro Summit Shack Ooh. person who has, you know, it's, it's a heater who yeah. uh, has some thoughts about the conduct of Holland House. Excuse me. Now, the first thing I uh, read about, in, in, or actually my first thought when I read this, as selfish as it sounds, was uh, butt rock or pop punk bands <laughs> are the only thing that play there. And I'm like, man, Grubby Paws has played there so many times. <laughs> like, are we butt rock? Because we're definitely not pop punk. And I, I literally had a second, I'm like, hey, what the fuck? <laughs> right. Are we, are, we, are we butt rock? really fuck it's like am i attacking myself right now yeah like oh you know and but then obviously there's there's a there's a vast difference of constituents mm -hmm. of 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 follower, followership you know those who go to holland house and, and those who go to summit shack now again now now we're kind of getting diving into the point of just strictly opinions uh, again, these are only our opinions, flex nothing else, um, uh, besides obviously the posts that we shared. Mm -hmm. um, this is just coming strictly from personal experience. Now, uh, at Summit Shack, it is a lot younger of a crowd um, from just what I've seen. Um, it, it is more declared and leaning towards, you know, strictly like safe, this is a safe space, which I'm all for. Uh, safe space. Um, oh, hold on, we got. I live in Gibsonburg, everybody. We got some vroom vrooms going on. By uh, shout out to Gibsonburg. Shout out to Gibsonburg and the little dick guy over there in his truck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm a, I'm out here in uh, Sylvania Township. <laughs> we out here. We out here. <laughs> we out here, dog. No? Yeah. But uh, it's it, it's primarily uh, created as a safe space for um, sort of. Uh, those who get less of an opportunity in mainstream music or just in music in general, you know, you know, the, you know, queer community, transgender community, people of color, uh, you know, fe female fronted or female, which that cringes, that cr term is cringeworthy already. And I'm, I'm sure I'll get flack for it. Um, but that is predominantly what is wanted to, you know, be played there. They sort of steer away from cis white bands mm -hmm. you know straight dude bands or whatever and that's under understood um but that's sort of that 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 crowd vice versa over here holland house is a lot more open to just like we'll have whoever play doesn't matter the genre person you know color race creed you know it's a lot more open but when you have a lot more open, there are there is the potential of some pretty not so pleasant people to come through there, you know. And so there there are pros and cons to both. And I feel that you know on this side over here, you know, you, people are a lot of people who are siding with Holland House. I mean, not even Holland House, but like are the, in the Toledo scene, you know, on that side of the I seventy five rivalry going, you know. BG people are too soft, you know, or like whatever. And then over here on the BG side, you know, everybody in Slater, are, you know, are fucking assholes, you know, they're fucking meatheads or whatever. So there's this going on, you know, and v validate me or invalidate me. Is this, is this what you've seen as well in the scene? Yeah. If, I mean, if we were just to kind of generalize and not really pinpoint too deeply right. from, from an out, from an outsider, it can appear as that. Um, exactly. But for, and then, but fortunately, um, in the position you and I are in, where bands who have played, if not at both venues, um, my bands have not played at either venue. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely open to it, but uh, we just we know all the people, and we know the people within exactly. the scene, and we know bands who do both venues. 
or are planning to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, once we're allowed to play music in front of people, not on a screen anymore, but, uh, yeah, five years from now, I guess, but I get right. But I guess if you're just an outsider looking in, that's probably what it would appear. But, mm -hmm. uh, right. I do, I do know, uh, in general in Bowling Green, they've always had like, not, I mean, first of all, BGSU is, is a, very 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 liberal school so that right. that kind of mentality is already there to begin with which is amazing you know yeah, amazing yeah, and great for sure um and then toledo in general it, not even just the the university of toledo but just in general it's like this, this like this part is just definitely like uh you got a little bit of everything like for i would almost consider the university of toledo moderate because you just got a little bit of everybody right it, and then you got some people just kind of hanging out in the middle. Um, so the mentalities definitely stem from the universities and like the areas of where they're in. Uh, that's that's a very that's a very you know that's a take that I, I I didn't even think about of you know there's still even the political climate of the local universities. Like mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, you know, and that's and that makes a lot of sense. You know and like we, we've said before, Tanner and I are just sort of, we're like Switzerland here. Like, hey, what's up, guys? You know, bomb the bed. You know, like, let's all just play music. We got chocolate. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Uh, but no, that's a, that's a very, very good point. And if, but if you are just in a vacuum looking at these situations based on what people say about the other, mm -hmm. that is sort of the, the picture I was painting. Yeah. Um, and I, And I hate that this came up, you know, in my head while I was kind of marinating on all this shit, but you know, everybody's favorite anti-Semite, Dr. Seuss. Um, he has a book. I can't remember the actual name of the book and maybe you can help me out, but it's the one that there's the one town over here that they make their toast butter side up. And then there's the other town over here that, I know makes, their, that makes their toast butter side down and they're literally warring. They're li they're literally at odds with each other and like sending armies at each other and stuff like do that. You, do you have a preference with your butter toast? I just like toast and butter, man. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't fucking matter. And that well, that's sort of like the the, <laughs> the uh, sort of uh, moral of the story. Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, is they come to an agreement of just like, hey, first and foremost, we're in the same business. No, we, we are literally in the same business of buttered toast. And when you put a butter side down and a butter side up toast together, it makes a complete sandwich, you know, and that's straight very, up very cheesy or buttery, if you will. But that's kind of the vibe I'm getting with this shit because um, with, with, you know, people over here getting frustrated, like, oh, they're fucking assholes and people over here going like, what the fuck is going on? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's, it's, you know, based on just what I'm seeing online, I think it's slowing down a little bit, but this is a known thing now and reputations are going to be at stake for a while on both mm -hmm. sides, I think. But the sort of position that I wanted to sort of talk about with you is that position of what the fuck? Right we're all in the business of making buttered toast. We're all in the business of playing shows. We're all it's in the all, business of sharing. It's songs. all delicious. It's all delicious, man. Right. And so one of the questions I want to ask you, and, and we can sort of talk about this is mm -hmm. first and foremost, what is your definition of DIY? What is a DIY music community to you? Well, Ian, I thought you'd never ask. Um, I've always wanted to do that. Well, uh, well you know what? While we're at it. Always have wanted to do that. Uh, my, de my definition of DIY, um, obviously everybody knows it means do it yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. And I guess in the music, in a music venue, musical mentality, if you want to put it, if you want to look at it like that, it's just kind of like, I think what both these venues saw is that they saw something lacking within their scene. And it could mm -hmm. be for a number, it could be a number of reasons that they maybe they just saw that local bands need this or 
touring bands need this. Uh, and I think both places just wanted to offer that kind of space for different bands that are just looking for something else. Because as you and I know, we've the majority of the times we played shows, it's a bar, whether it's a promoter or it's independent. Yeah. Um, very varying experiences, but for the most part, very positive. And uh, I think I think another thing about that as well is, uh, you know, with with having a bar, with having a restaurant that do and promoters that have these shows, yet they have certain guidelines they have to do. With the DIY venue, it's kind of like obviously the safety and the reputation is right. an all time must. But it's like we can kind of like do our own thing and like right. be like you're. And like Cali being your own boss. So I think with both places, they just want to do their own thing while um, en- enhancing the lives of other musicians. Right. So would you, would you agree? And I, I agree with all that. Um, but would you also agree that um, the DIY community at its core is attempting to be, you know, 100% centric on artistic integrity or are just supporting the arts as much as they can. Right. Yeah. That's probably the one, probably the one, the one point I forgot to mention or didn't think about. So I'm glad you brought that up. It's just like literally giving them a space, giving these artists a space to literally just do their own thing. And be them. Right. Be and them so, in, front of, in front of people. So and so where I kind of want to get at with this is the core value of, of, of DIY, that ethos of, I really love how you put it, of just like, it's people, musicians, artists who are frustrated with the club scene and see how in the wheelings dealings of, of you know, you know, there's big pharma, but the, you know, there's, there's, there's big industry, so to speak, mm-hmm. big music industry booking industry yeah um they're frustrated with that so they say fuck it we're gonna do it ourselves you know and so we have these awesome venues that are being done out of people's homes which again to both venues amazing job that you guys are doing it's you know that's that's the scene i love because it's very homegrown you know whereas you have like your your main big venues i i see that as like asphalt you know, just like one big old fucking steamroller, like, blah, you know, whereas uh, a DIY venue is a lot like a cobblestone road where mm-hmm. each one, each rock is crafted and placed and it's, you know, it, it, it just has that energy of like, there's, there's, there's a prettiness to it. And there's also just a, you know, like homegrown organic men- like feeling with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the core of it. Okay. That's the core of what we're doing here, but yet for some reason, and I'm going to, I'm going to put this to you in a second. Okay. Um, it is apparent, at least to me that that mentality is, is getting lost on the core values of you know, what it is to do DIY. And the idea is to be accepting to all artists and mediums and to give them platforms, you know, and give them a place to be and a place to be themselves. I think those core values could potentially be getting lost because we're seeing a squabble right now on the interwebs of, you know, shit, a fucking website, right. you know? And the real venomous like responses coming from both sides you know and not necessarily the the venue owners themselves but like people who go to those venues or support those venues they're sort of saying some pretty venomous things and i think that mentality is getting lost of why the fuck are we even doing this Mm -hmm. do you agree or disagree no i i totally agree um and i apologize i forget we talked in like the pre-show or right now or in this current recording yeah. but also ultimately like i mean the point the point of these venues and like both venues uh is to give musicians a place to do their um to do their thing you know these musicians mus- musicians come from different backgrounds uh 
they cl- they classify themselves in you know different ways. Um, you know, I'm just kind of just putting it all together right now, and uh, it's just both places give the opportunity for people to kind of just like unify that through music, and uh, ultimately, ultimately, they, they, these bands just want to write music and play for people, and uh, another another thing with like kind of like the Toledo BG area in general is like we don't have a ton of big venues and like we've had venues come and go or oh, yeah. it exists in varying forms. So another kind of uh, point I wanted to add is like, say you want to hit up a bar or what, whatever venue for a show and they're booked that weekend, you could possibly hit up a DIY venue and be like, Hey, is, do you have any openings? And then it's like, you know what I mean? So if the venues are full, then you can hop on the DIY venue to do a show if you want to get that, Friday or Saturday night show, and if, if that makes sense. So if anything, it's just another, literally giving them another spot to play. And But to kind of go back to that point of like the true meaning of these DIY venues of getting lost or not, it's possible because, I mean, um, I know these, I can't give you an exact year or number of years, but these venues have been around for a while and they've, uh, they've both gained a lot of clout. And by clout, I mean like, recognition and hype because both both places put on incredible shows and had has had um amazing artists come through um not just locally because nothing about toledo that doesn't get its credit to credit do and there's a lot of people working towards that there's so much fucking talent in the four and nine area and i know guys like uh chris peapod daher are really trying to make that known and you know just Mm -hmm. literally other bands like hyping up other bands and personally myself i try and hype that up as much as possible if like to give bands that i my band plays with some love and same thing goes to these venues and yeah you know, like when you over time when you get recognition over time when you get kind of like the clout you feel like you're the shit you know yeah. people are telling you like yo your venue's dope or the bands you're having is dope but it, it's possible that you know like either side can just be like hell yeah and like you know and sometimes that kind of, and then it can become like a competition Kind of like we said, like with UT and BG, like the football and basketball and sports rivalry that um, sometimes, and of course I can't, I definitely cannot speak for either venue. I know you can't either, right. but you know, at some point, yeah, it probably did come become a competition and th- to see who can put on the dopest show. I think that's ultimately what the competition is who can put on the dopest show, who can have whatever bands come through, uh, ticket sales, number of bodies of attending social media. It's all, you know, and especially with social media, it's all like, you can be like, yo, look how many people are here tonight or here tonight. And uh, right. so that kind of, that kind of clouds everything a little bit too. And uh, cause to me, even though social media is great, it's also stupid at the same time. Um, yeah. So, so when people post about any, either venue, um, it can misrepresent it. I believe and very true. Yeah. And and bands and bands can be misrepresented too. And I feel bad for a lot of bands who are neutral or just like cool with everybody. Um, but I definitely know there's some bands who are kind of getting lumped into the situation uh by default. Like, oh right. these these guys play here more, these guys play here more. So like they totally have to be biased. Um there's probably some biases and that just comes with any situation like this um you hand it but, over to human beings there's going to be some form of flaw and bias i mean that's just kind of known 100 percent mm-hmm. um so I, well, I think it eventually became the competition i would love to see from the summer shack and the holland house would be like who can put on the dopest show but in the sense of like okay they're killing it i want to kill it too so it's like it's really like i don't know like you you see a band that does super well or there's someone in life that's killing it and you're just like i want to aspire to that as in like i want to be able just to be the best i can be at my thing and just be able to like kill it and if i'm able to inspire others to like want to be a good musician or to run like a really dope venue then i think that's what it really should be about just like i would love to see both that's the word i was kind of looking for not competition i love to see both places like like inspire each other to like be the best they can be iron so. iron sharpening iron literally mm-hmm. just t- turning into you no know, because competition i feel is healthy as somebody who who loves football and played it for for a little bit until i gave up on it and 
you know, focused on guitar. I was always a I was always a band kid, so <laughs> I'm not. If you know me, I'm not big enough to play football anyway, and that's fine. Yeah, you have a you have a stout running back body. Don't 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 give Dude, yourself that whack. Honestly, probably my favorite players who have ever played in college or college in the NFL are probably running backs. Like, uh, if you know me, I'm a Lions fan, so guys like um, Barry Sanders, I just absolutely worship him. Not a big guy. No, he's only like five seven, five eight. I'm five six, and then uh, was I really appreciate the time I was at in college because I got to see Kareem Hunt play mm-hmm. at UT while he was in college, and like so, like being in band, so like being at every football game and getting to watch guys like him in particular just like kill it is just like you know that was that's probably one of my favorite memories from college is being able to be in college while he was an athlete there and. Despite, you know, despite all the controversies he's had in the past couple of years, he's an amazing athlete and running backs just get beat on so hard. It's just a, and, guy, and like guys like Darren Sproles, like he's a super amazing guy to watch. And um, he's, he's a little, he's a little guy. He's, he's my height. So and, yeah. um, they call him Mighty Mouse actually. Like I think Drew, Bre- when he played for the Saints, he, he was called Mighty Mouse a lot, but uh <laughs> Oh, so it, but exactly so. Yeah, so don't 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 count yourself out. But <laughs> I was always I was always a musician though, band and guitar. That was just my thing, and I did theater in high school, so I was just an artsy kid. Nerd. <laughs> Got the glasses, so I mean, cooler. same. And I, I mean, uh, I actually abandoned even attempting sports because everybody around me was a fucking nerd, and they didn't care. So right. where I was getting at though. Uh, is with football or, or just games like that, competition is healthy, you know, because mm-hmm. when you're an athlete, you know, you want to put your best foot forward and you always, you're always aiming to be the best. And you put yourself around people who, yeah, might give you competition, but you, you know, I, that person is going to make me work harder, you know? And, Absolutely. and so I think there's for, for the, like the two years, I think that both venues have been kind of a thing. Um, there was a good bit of that. But I think amongst other things, there there are maybe uh, things we obviously don't know behind the scenes that create frustration. And I think this event this week was a sort of um, exposure of a lot of bottled up feelings between the two places and the people who support the two places. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, just from reading the comment sections on Facebook and Twitter, a lot of people have a lot of opinions on both venues, both sides, you know. A lot always, people... always have, always will. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's just what... how it goes. Yeah. And it's sort of, again, and I, I think you, you hit on the point earlier of, you know, there's a lot of things being said that don't necessarily ac- accurately reflect the venues and the there's people a lot who run of... the venues. There's a lot, but there... there's a lot of benefit of the doubt for sure. But I also have a belief. I also have a belief that amongst that bullshit that it is centered somewhere. It comes from somewhere. Like, you know, obviously we're here in the situation room right now. (laughs) Uh, It's sort of like how I I hate we're diving here. I think it's because the alcohol is talking now. Uh, It's how I revere uh, conspiracy theories. You know, a lot of them are fucking stupid. And it's like, okay, that's insane. Mm-hmm. But there's a little bit right here that's like, you know, I didn't think about that. You know, I didn't think about it like that. I didn't, I didn't realize, you know, maybe the government does have that kind of power or something like that could be covered up because they do, they do do that, don't they? A lot like, of things are leaking right now, right? Yeah, so and so it might not necessarily be this big whole cool thing of like there's reptiles out there, you know, there's people, reptilian people in the basement of Congress, they're running everything. There's the people behind the curtain, you know, like and, and that's a I, I agree, and there there's definitely like there's a big picture to everything, but you know, with what's going on, there's gotta be just there's probably just something that like very few people know about and that just like it's secrecy. Yeah. It's 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 the the idea of something comes from somewhere. Something doesn't just 
fall out of the fucking sky. These opinions and these feelings didn't fall out of the fucking sky. Mm-hmm. People are feeling things for a reason. Are they justified? Maybe, maybe not. You know, that's, that's per each situation, per each person's experience. Like clearly the person who made the Holland House Rules Twitter account had a very bad time at Holland House. Whereas somebody like me, like anytime I've played there, it's been an awesome time. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the people who run it, I consider friends. And they've always been very open of like, yeah, dude, fucking come out and hang out. You know, like that's that in my eyes creates a good feeling. You know, so somebody might have had an experience that influenced their really intense feelings about it. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to um what's the word I'm looking for? I'm I don't want to dissuade or, or sort of disengage or um you know un unvalidate invalidate I should say invalidate their opinion or their right. feelings. I don't want to invalidate them. Because it came it came from somewhere. Clearly something happened at Holland House. And you know I've even had personal things that happened, uh personal experiences at Summit Shack where you know, I definitely felt like the odd man out and kind of uncomfortable and uh, felt like it's been damn near impossible to book gigs there or have Grubby Paws have an opportunity to play there. We uh, played there once um, and then I played an acoustic gig there. So it's not like I, I've been barren and they've been very kind in, in letting us play there or having me play there as well. Mm-hmm. But the, but I I had had experiences of frustration personally. This is just myself where, yeah. um, you know, because I'm 31 and everybody who plays shows there is like 19, you know, and right. And, and it's like and like I'm 20 and I'm 25 and like I'll be out of college for, I think like, yeah, in two days I'll officially be out of college for a year and uh, so it's like I'm in that weird spot where it's like I'm not too far removed. From like, but, early, but you're early. away from it. Yeah. No, and, and and so are my feelings are uh, the true representation of Summer Shack? Absolutely not, not at all. But it came from a an honest place of mm-hmm. man, this is fucking frustrating. You know, or like man, you know, I feel old. <laughs> you know, right. I, I feel like I'm. You know, as somebody who, you know, with long hair and tattoos and stuff like that and have always been very left-leaning all my entire life, you know, Mm -hmm. very leftist policies and beliefs, I felt like the boomer, (laughs) you know, because people are so, are so, even if they're not necessarily young, it's a very young energy, you know, and it's also a different energy. You know, something I was thinking about while we've been talking is you also look at the ethos of either or and at summit shack they're predominantly like twinkle guitar emo midwest indie chill a little bit more pulled back some high energy bands and and some maybe even a little bit of screamy screams but Mm -hmm. but that sort of aesthetic is very much that now, although Holland House has bands like that that play there, um, a lot of the people who support Holland House and who uh, even work at Holland House are very centric in like punk and like that kind of like, like I'm going to drink a bunch of fucking whiskey and I'm going to fall off my fucking skateboard, middle fingers in the air, like that mentality, which right. is the mentality I grew up with. You know, that's, that's sort of my mentality as a musician, you know, mm-hmm. where you have people who have a, even though <laughs> uh, our guitar player in Gary Paws, Eric, who is my heterosexual life mate, and I love him very much. Uh, he has a giant pedal board. And so he's able to do that a thing, lot of cool. The thing's legit, yeah. Yeah. I, on the other hand, have like two, you know, you know, little pedals here. And before that, I'm a very fucking fuck you, plug, plug it in, turn it up, fuck you, punk rock forever. Right. Take my shirt off. Look, look how bad this is. Look how <laughs> terrible this is. You know, like, yeah. listen to the noises. You know, that's, that was the scene I grew up in. And so I think that's a lot of the aesthetic. And I love how even the, uh, 
the Holland House Rules Twitter made the joke of like shirtless white dudes, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, you know, like that's sort of like what you what you do when when you're fucking playing punk riffs and shirts are off, you know. But uh, it's part of the aesthetic. It's part of the aesthetic, but it's the sort of. The, but you look at those core values. The core values at Summerchack, are they wrong for those values? No, absolutely not. And, and Holland House. I, it's kind of go back to, our, and it's kind of to go back earlier to like what DIY means is like, not only it's like, can you like create the environment is as long as you're not hurting people or others, it's like, you can kind of create the environment you want and right. they cater and like each place caters to like, you know, like the emo Midwest or you got like your pop punk or hardcore or, or whatever core you want to call right. it. Uh, that's the thing. Both places can have what bands they want and create what kind of vibe they want as long as long as everything's all cool so i don't know if right. i'm wording that well but that's no kind of add to you, that. you hit a very very poignant point there of i'm not here trying to piss off people or offend they want but it's just like venues these venues can do what they want right exactly and the end game here is a couple things the end game is playing some fucking shows giving a platform to artists to share their music. And then most importantly, I, I really like your wording. I'm just like, make sure everything's cool. Mm -hmm. Just make sure everything's cool, man. Like there has been so many times in this quarantine and, and there is so many times in conversations with bandmates, conversations with friends who are in bands, um, conversations with you about this, you know, mm -hmm. there in my head, I am just screaming, can we just be fucking cool? Can we be cool? Can we, can we chill? <laughs> in a per in a perfect world, because like another another thing to go about to talk about Toledo is we're not a very big city, and we're kind of we're definitely like the weird stepchild of like Detroit, De De Detroit and Cleveland, yeah, uh, and, and everything else around. Uh, I I know we definitely look up to Detroit and Cleveland, literally and figuratively. Uh, for an inspiration, Toledo was kind of our own thing, and you and I have been multiple. You and I have been in multiple bands uh, mm. throughout the past decade or so, and uh, and like the same thing with a lot of people. The, the scene is made up of a lot of people who've been in different bands, whether with each other or others. I've seen a lot of bands come and go. I've seen a lot of musicians come and go, but I've seen a lot of people uh, stick around. It's, the, and it's, it's always, the way it goes. It's the way it goes. I've been in a handful, fucking handful of bands myself uh, between like 2012 and now, and uh, I'll run into a lot of same, like same people who I did shows with who are either in the same band. And that's another thing, the longevity, like the lifespan of a lot of bands around here isn't very long, but then there's some who have been kicking it forever. And, uh, but what I'm kind of going with that is there's just always been like a community of people. Like there's just, you can go to any venue. There's just that familiar face or in our case, there's usually like every other person is familiar and you can probably say the same too. No, you 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 hit on it perfectly. I mean, I have been playing music for closing in on twenty years. Essentially, essentially. I mean, obviously, not exactly, but we're closing in on a twentieth year of of playing music, going to shows, and playing shows. And it's it's kind of an old head mentality, but it's a true mentality in that mm. the scene is always going to change. Like you said, people are going to come and go. The lifespan of a band now mm -hmm. is terrifyingly short sometimes, you know, because people sort of realize like, oh, what the fuck? Because <laughs> the idea of being a musician, and, and we can dive into this here in a little bit, the idea of being a musician is very attractive on the outside. You know, like you craft something um, and you get better at an instrument. It's you're able to create things that are orally pleasing, you know, and, and, th and then be able to perform. So you get that energy of that, you know, that maybe the internal ham that you didn't know you had mm -hmm. you get to perform and, and connect with people. It's a very attractive thing to an outsider of like, man, I wish I could play guitar. Like, man, I wish I could be on mm -hmm. stage playing. And know? it's also, and it's also really, and to add to that, it's like able to do that with other people who mm -hmm. share the same feelings and or be able to show or come up with something that you never thought of. So at the same time, it's also a massive collaborative effort. It's like, oh, getting to work with oh, yeah. other talented people, it's, it's, it's amazing. 
in a vacuum, these things are all very attractive things. Like, yes, dude. But the reality is you have to be a fucking psycho to be a musician. You have to be fucking insane to think that this is a good thing to do. Yeah. You know, you have to, you have to be a fucking nuthead if you think um, this, this lifestyle is good. Um, and that's not a bad thing because clearly you and I, we do this shit, you know? And like how much money have you spent over the years on – guitar or music equipment i don't even want to think about it <laughs> Man. you know getting... i could have bought a house in cash thinking about all the money i've spent and lost on shows on equipment on trailers on vans on countless hours in the studio all this money is thrown at this 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 thing that drives us why the fuck we do it you know we but we do it so that you have to have a little bit of psych putting you to do this, you know? And so I think a lot of people nowadays, especially in the social media age, they start bands and then they're in it for a little bit and they go, wait, what the fuck is this? And they're hopping out of it. So I, I feel, and again, um, you can, you can elaborate on this because I, if I'm out of, especially if I'm out of pocket on it is I feel like the younger social media generation is has a different experience and a different per- perception in um, of how to be a band and what it is to be a band. Mm-hmm. You know, man, my, my, my yeah, I'll just think of a question right now is, is it a good or bad thing um, to sort of change the rules? You know, because we're in this, in this idea of evolving, mm-hmm. you know, of what it is to be a band, what it is to be a musician, or what it is to run a venue. Um, is it bad that we might take away some of the values that we hold near and dear and put new ones in? Is that a good or a bad thing? Um, wow, that's deep. Um It goes either way. Yeah. When I think about it, because on one hand, you want to absolutely, I want to evolve. I want to be with the times. I want to be hip. I want to get with the kids, not in that way, NSA and people out there. No, but I want want to be hip. You know, I want to, I want to be in the current. I don't want to be living in the past. I don't, you know, want to be too ahead of the curve. I want to be here in the pocket with everybody. But at the same time, Personally, for me, and please elaborate on this on yourself. Okay. I have a hard time giving up on a lot of my values as a musician Mm -hmm. to these new ways of doing things because I'm very much of the old school mentality of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Fix the stuff that needs to be fixed. Absolutely. Change, evolve, social media, distribution of music, and how we promote. Fix all that shit. But don't take away the values that brought me into music, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's sort of one of my fears I'm having with, with this kind of new generation of shows and venues and bands, because I, I, I love how you got my gears turning about this idea of the lifespans of bands now aren't what they were. No. You know, I remember when I was when I was a wee playing with with bands of older dudes they had been in that band for fucking ever. You know, like, I would always look up to, like, bands I was playing with and, like, you know, they've been in the scene for, like, 12 fucking years. Yeah. Nowadays, that's unheard of. You know, we as Grubby Paws have been a live act playing shows since we played our first show as a band and not an acoustic outfit in 2014, but we were an acoustic outfit a couple years prior. hmm You know, we're six plus years in we're like ancient dude <laughs> you know and but who's uh so in grubby paws who's the oldest guy and who's the youngest guy <laughs> and, um, dude, no no room for ages here i just i'm just curious oh uh our oldest person is eric who's 39 mm-hmm. um who's been who's been 
in bands and playing shows since the nineties. And I, you know, at some point I'm going to get him here on here. He is a wellspring of, of ranting and wisdom. Uh, next is our, uh, our soundscape noise auxiliary guy, Nick, he's 35, I think 34 or 35. Oh, he might be turning, th- he might be 36. He was born in 84. Uh, and then I'm next. I'm 31. Jimmy's 29 and our drummer Jake is the baby at 28. So when I say the baby at 28, <laughs> compa- compared to like other bands, he's the old guy. But we right. just have like the great, like the grandpa, the great grandpa, and the great great grandpa in the band as well. Dude, I I hear that. Um, most, I mean, most of you guys probably know right now. I'm in a band with nine other people. Uh, but the age Tanner's difference. Tanner's in Slipknot. Everybody, he is Jim Root. Dude, I I told you I got a tattoo right here of him. Uh, <laughs> I got a couple layers. I'm not gonna show, but uh, hi, hiding my quarantine chubbiness but uh actually the, the age range isn't bad um i think the oldest oldest in the band i can't i'm not gonna go chronological really but uh the oldest i believe is our percussionist synth player jeremy he's 27 our tuba player alec he's only he's 27 he's only like a month younger than jeremy mm-hmm. um i know the baby uh that would be our trombonist Michael Borges. He is, I'm pretty sure he's, yeah, he's 20. Because I, I just talked to him. He's about to turn 21 like a month or two. Uh, he's like, I can't go to a fucking bar. <laughs> dude, when, when I see him start doing shows, uh, our, our one guitar player, Kyle Pollock, he was the baby for a while. Uh, right. So, like, when he, <laughs> it was really like everybody else gets to wristbands, and he's just like going up to like Zach Jacobs or Cody Sizemore, just being like, all right, get out the Sharpie and then, you know, the smiley faces. Um, Hell yeah. Uh, but like, I think you're, you're really, I think you're in a cool position because um, you've been in the scene for a while yourself, but you have a guy who's been in the scene longer or been in a scene longer. So it's just total wealth of knowledge. It's something I just thought of is, uh, was so like 20 years ago when you started, what was the kind of the state of like, venues and like if DIY venues were a thing because the first time I ever really started going to shows was like 2008 at like Frankie's well when I first started the D okay I will do my very best to not be the old old, long-winded old man here Um, (laughs) back in my day the DIY scene wasn't a place so to speak. It was sort of like guerrilla warfare. Mm-hmm. You found a basement. It wasn't a franchised basement. It was just somebody's, a buddy's fucking basement. Or, you know, you begged mom and dad. Excuse me. You begged mom and dad or somebody or you had an extra paper out or delivered a lot of pizzas and you forked over some security deposit money and rented a uh, VFW hall for a weekend. You know, that that was the state of our shows back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I really kind of started really playing shows in the early mid 2000s. And that was over in like Fremont, you know, really, and even Bowling Green. You know, there, there was a couple like eventually in the mid to late 2000s, you know, like the BLV house and just the, I can't remember, there was another, uh, BG venue that was sort of like done out of a house and, the, mm-hmm. and that's sort of when those things started evolving. But, you know, I come from, a, I come from a world where it was just open. It was just like anywhere, any fucking time, let's fucking go. You know, and I think back to uh, when we played the opening night, the soft opening night of uh, the Ottawa Tavern when it was uh, grubby and, and ice cream militia just, you know, a couple months ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, you leaned over, um, like uh, you're on the top of the, you know, where the former older, old now the new old stage, the, now the old new stage. It's kind of like the lounge now. Yeah, it's the lounge now. You're like leaning over, you know, that post, and you were just kind of like, hey, like Jack Black said, you know, like 
you know, it just essentially just uh, giving me the idea of like, I'm not good at anything else, but we're here to fucking rock. So let's <laughs> fucking rock. And I was just like, yes, you know, and, but that was the mentality. That was the mentality of it was. I'm all about that. I'm all about that life. You know, just like, what the fuck else are we going to do? Let's fucking rock right here, right now. Where are we going? Hey, I'm going to fucking call up my dude, David, you know, and say like, hey, your parents are, you know, out of the house for the weekend. Like, let's <laughs> fucking have a show in the basement. I have played in my time so many shows in basements and living rooms. I, I remember uh, in like 2005, 2006, playing a show on a back patio, you know, playing metalcore. <laughs> that's, that's the best. Yeah. Like that, that was the shit I was brought up in. So kind of going back to my point of like now, is it toxic of somebody like me and even you to still hang on to those values because mm -hmm. it feels like those values are kind of the, the current scenes are kind of going away from that. There are That's, some that are trying to rejuvenate that, but sadly the crowds <clears throat> may not, may not be necessarily going that direction. Yeah. I, I got a funny perspective on that. Um, and I, it'll kind of lead towards a, actually a very similar vein. So I grew up, um, and still live in the Sylvania area. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually live like only a few miles away from uh, Holland House. Fun fact. Um, right. Fun fact. Actually, I drive by that place probably all the time because it's just yeah, it's just en route to wherever I have to go and, for a lot of times. And, go to that uh, Circle K, baby. Dude, you you know it. That uh, family video right there. I remember going there as a lot as a kid. Just like I mean, back in my day when streaming was not really wasn't a thing well, at all we had to rent videos i remember dude i remember getting vhs's like oh, yeah. it'd be a, i mean it'd be a friday saturday night whether if i was kicking it at home or it's like i knew i'd be going somewhere the thing to do back like when you're in like elementary school junior high early high school is to like hang out with friends and play video games and watch movies that's just, especially in the suburbs um if you're not outdoors doing whatever and like your parents are the ones picking you up and all that. But uh, I remember going to family to that family video and just getting movies to like, and video games to entertain myself or like others. So I'm not being a thing, but uh, kind of going back to that growing up in the suburbs, we didn't really have that where like you could just go to someone's house and just have a show because right. since it's like a suburb or like a subdivision, it's just like the houses are pretty close to each other. So it's like, sound ordinance and stuff like that yeah it's sound ordinances are a thing and, and especially in sylvania where it's just like a very i want to say uptight community but it's like there wouldn't be the first ones to be like yo i know I <laughs> trying, a little bit. dude i was trying to be nice but um hey we're opening this shit up tanner i know okay. you're all about tanner time <laughs> it's open right now baby boy all right here Not we go let loose if, uh, here we go if, the, a bit. if there was if there was a part of toledo where a lot of karens live Sylvania, Ohio. That's if we want to put it like that. Yeah. Uh, because I used I used to work at Wendy's and the typical the Wendy's on Central and King across from Meyer in in uh on Central Avenue in Sylvania. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the clientele were the soccer moms who would pull up in like Jeeps or the, the Dodge Grand Caravans or the type the Chrysler Town Countries. They got their stupid kids in the back seat coming from Paysetter Park from soccer practice or t-ball or whatever mm -hmm. and these these moms that have the hair cut to right here oh yeah they'd be wearing the workout shit but they weren't working out and when they're paying for their kids kids meals they're handing you a credit card with their husband's name on it so like that's where i kind of grew up around which is fine uh because now they got, it's they got the, they got 911 on that speed dial like there's a long way to puerto rican in the yard what oh no <laughs> They got 911 speed dial just so they can press one less button. But uh, so like the idea of like hitting up people just to do a show wasn't a thing. So right. for for the kids in the suburbs, um, I want to give a shout out to the Tropic Bombs guys because a lot of them are from the Sylvania area. Oh, uh, hell their, yeah. their thing was to like go to a venue and do, do the show. So getting out of the suburbs to like go to Frankie's, number one, like a lot of people from Sylvania were like, go to the east side? What? Are you crazy? I'm like, yeah, but I just saw like four or five punk rock bands or whatever bands for like maybe five dollars. Yes, Hell my yeah. mom, my mom or dad had to pick myself and my friend up, but it was, it was fun as shit. And I, I wasn't really like 
a troublemaker of any kind. I just wanted to go and just watch bands and have a good time. And then yeah. eventually being able to be in a band and to be able to like get out and play these venues. But um, how I kind of tap into a similar vein with you goes with Ice Cream Militia. And the big thing with that is we all met in college. I went to high school. I went to high school with our drummer, Zach, but as a collective unit, we all met at the University of Toledo. And so a lot of the first shows we played were basement parties. So like our one bandmate, Jake, he had a house that's like directly right off campus of UT. Yeah. And uh, he would just throw big ass parties there, like uh, 100, 200 people in this like duplex type house. And like, that's where we got our start was being like a party band and then eventually um some friends some friends of our some friends of ours had a house behind the engineering campus at ut mm-hmm. and we're like you should come play at our house and it's really just like going from yeah. one it's not like a diy venue or anything it's really just like college basement parties but um, but could one consider loosely being a party band, playing house shows, kind of DIY. Yes, because we, and, and did we, but here's the thing, did we think about that at the time? No. No. But as we're talking about it's that. It's the yeah. same ethos though. Mm-hmm. Same mentality. Fuck it, man. We'll, have, we'll play our own, play. We'll, play, we'll put on our own thing. Mm-hmm. Fuck the venues, come fucking hang out. <clears throat> play some, you know, granted the house shows that were for parties, those either were good or bad uh, because the <laughs> main goal of that was to party rather than to go there to enjoy music. That's no, the main 100%. difference. But I think that there's a little twinge of that similar ethos of come on down, fucking let's – it's togetherness. It's bringing things together in some capacity. No, absolutely. What we And what we would do is like – and like what's funny is like each house kind of had like their own like names – like how Summit Shack is Summit Shack, Holland House is Holland House. The house that um, the Ice Cream Militia pretty much really became our thing was called the Duplex because it was a because <laughs> because it was a duplex and we were friends with Jake and all the other guys who live in the house and they're all six dudes so it was like the Duplex and then uh, the other place we played out was called Greenway and that's just because it was like behind the universe it's behind the engineering campus at UT but it was literally on the street there's like green like the street's name is greenway so we just called it like the greenway house um oh yeah but at, but literally like thank you for pointing that out we didn't think it was diy at the time because it's really just like well these are our houses or these are our friends houses are letting us have a show and we weren't and like we weren't really it wasn't where we, we weren't charging people it was really just a party but then just happening to have a band right but it's 100% a DIY mentality. And uh, yeah, fucking it's, it's the idea of bringing, bring them in. We're having, we're doing our own thing. Let's connect. And the, right. And the, and just the last point I really want to make is uh, the first show Ice Cream Militia did where it was like a venue because we did, we've done shows at like UT a few times just because yeah. we were students and people happened to have an event, needed a band, whatever. Uh, but the first venue show we ever did was April 2016 at Frankie's at the Flint Water uh, charity show. Yeah. And this was like, and this was, and the funny, so like, kind of like the, that was a funny time to get into venues because we were literally about the late 2015, we were about to like try and play venues in Toledo. And then the local promoter kind of like took that break for a while. So we were just kind of like, what do we do? Just playing more basement shows. So that Frankie's show was the first time like these venues were opening back up again after five six seven months of chilling out and uh um and i mean we all we all know like that now i have to go into the history of it but uh i don't know it's all i mean it's all good but our big thing was just like taking that party band mentality of just like we're a party band that wants to be good musicians like very much uh red hot chili peppers instead like being a party band but also like really being cognizant of the music that we're putting forth and uh wanting to make wanting to make any show feel like a party just everybody having a good time and we try and bring that at any venue we ever do so like those house shows pretty much solidify what we are right and and yeah you know, I, lo- I love that 
you experience that world and you bring try to bring that energy with every show you play even you're playing a club backyard basement somebody's you know uh quinceanera or something you know like just whatever <laughs> that'd uh, be, playing, that's playing the one thing we have that's the one thing we haven't done that'd be tight as shit <laughs> oh yeah uh but again I, I i want to go back to obviously this whole podcast is centered around this happening that happened there's bad blood or whatever but the kind of resolution i want to happen hopefully it happens is sort of that mentality of the whole goal here come on in Mm -hmm. let's let's connect let's figure it out we're doing it ourselves you know we're we're going to make this a a community and with every community there comes not so great times there comes some turbulent moments there's come some pretty toxic people and it's gonna happen um but i don't want shit like this to be a uh line you know i'm making lines here you know you're either this side or this side you know the goal of this podcast again was to find a, a us we you know like there's no us versus them it's not holland house versus summit shack you know it's Holland House and Summit Shack, they play fucking shows. They have great bands that come through there. They have friendly people who work there that will fucking give the shirt off their backs. You know, it exists. I think we just need to get back to that shit. And, and something mm-hmm. I want to kind of, because we're coming up on uh, almost two hours now, uh, time <laughs> flies when you're having fun with Tanner time. Yes, sir. Um, uh something I really kind of want to leave on here is uh, I was actually talking to our guitar player the other night um, and it really kind of re re-inspired me on something I had been sitting on for a while and, and something I, I kind of want to project out into the universe and, and hopefully out to any viewership and listenership of anybody who is either pro summit shack or pro Holland house to kind of drop that bullshit because the true essence of DIY in my eyes happened uh, at the very beginning of February before all this shit really hit. Um, We booked a mini tour, a a mini, you know, essentially three venue run of uh, we played in uh, Kent and then um, in New Jersey and then in Queens, New York, you know, just a little, back run onto the coast and back. Um, and at the point I was booking this shit, I was very disenfranchised with the DIY community because I felt like we were sort of escaping what I thought to be what was DIY. It felt a lot of gatekeeping going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was kind of frustrated but I, I said, fuck it. I'm going to try and we're going to do a run here. Got some vacation time. Let's go. And that tour, tour, that weekend run, barely want to call it a tour. I mean, I call it a tour because, first of all, a lot of bands around, like around that area, really don't get out too much. Right. So shout out to you guys for uh, getting out to New Jersey and New York on top of getting to uh, Kent. So kudos to you guys. That's Thanks. awesome. Oh, you tried. Fuck. And um, and I and I do want to add that you you touched on the uh, the like because like the last show we did before the pandemic shutdown was at Ottawa Tavern like reopening and uh, mm-hmm. I know you got you guys hopped on and then we played right after you guys and you guys just I just enjoy you guys every single time I get to like listen and play with you guys so that was a really buddy and that was probably, absolutely and like that was honestly like my last fun memory before the pandemic was just like (laughs) no you know it's funny like that that was friday friday 13th march march 13th it was just a i know man i know but it was just it was just such a good time with like we're celebrating really you know zach and kirsten like getting this you know bring bringing the auto tavern back to life not just for them but like for the community uh happened to be perry jacobs uh birthday dude perry the man perry he's the man i i love that dude oh yeah um and it was just like you know to me like 
the pandemic was stressing me out like you know like what led up to it like you know like because mm-hmm. that was a week when like okay the the nba and the ncaa shutting down like you know and like no one knew what was going on so like everybody's just so you know it was so much doubt if anything and like i think that was the first time that week where i could just like just do something i enjoy and makes me happy and like just be around amazing people so that was probably that was like my last like really Hoorah. nice memory before all this shit and it was really, and you can probably agree, it was nice to at least get one show in oh, yeah. uh, before everything shut down. Because prior to that, we hadn't played a show since uh, New Year's Eve at the Iowa Tavern. And like we were literally like gearing for 2020 to be a really cool year for us. Because um, we took January and February to kind of chill. And then like starting with the OT show, and then we had another show uh, at Handmade Toledo, which... I would almost consider that DIY because right, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, for it's sure. Not, it's a store that became a venue, or it's a store that like we offer shows and we want to give that space. It's not necessarily a but venue. But who runs but... it? Artists. Yeah. Art centric people. That 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 spirit is there. For so sure. we, we so we just had a lot of fun stuff coming up this year. We're trying to, you know, figure out what to do right now. I mean, we put out we put out a video of us doing one of those like. I watched it the other day. It's fucking sick. Thank you. So we're trying to just do stuff like that and just be entertaining. I'm really happy you're doing. You're not, I'm happy you're doing stuff like this to keep yourself busy, also to entertain and yeah. On top of you know, uh, tackling subjects, it's just this is a lot of fun. So oh yeah, dude. Um, well, I appreciate everything you said, and and likewise, you know, I didn't think about it, but yeah, that was like the last fun thing we did. <laughs> uh, fun thing I did for sure. Right. Um, but going back to, to that little weekend run, yeah, um, it was 100% booked, 100% booked strictly by going to DIY Facebook groups, like DIY Cleveland, DIY Akron, DIY, um, NYC, you know, because at we had part, already, at what part of Jersey were you in again? Uh, fuck it. Oh my God. Tom's River. A word, okay. Tom's River, New Jersey. I was like, wait, oh my God, I'm short circuiting. Well, we had booked the Tom's River show way back in like August. Oh, wow. Yeah, because we they somehow, some way, uh, our new record that we had put out in August had gone on their radar over in New Jersey, and they were like, we love this sick. new record. Would you love to come out and play? They're a DIY venue out there. They self-run, self-own. What's the place called again? Uh, fuck. It's the Clubhouse of Tom's River. We'll give a shout out to them. Yeah, shout out Clubhouse. You know, they were super nice. Um, but they they were like, come on out, and we were kind of talking amongst ourselves, like, fuck it, let's go to New Jersey. But we kind of need to make it a little you know make a little more sense so let's book some shows so i tried booking a couple shows around it you know one before and one after on the way home um and it was strictly done through diy communities no fucking bullshit with big time agencies anything like that or or necessarily even promoters Mm -hmm. just like diy groups on facebook and me just going hey we're a band where's our album if you want to listen to us but yeah well we got some show we got a show in new jersey we're trying to just figure this out and that that ethos that that togetherness and community was is so prevalent even in something as toxic as a fucking facebook group you know like <laughs> they were like yeah dude fucking here's t- you know call this person or here oh hey or people would like personally message me like hey do you want to play a show here like that was so awesome and, and sort of the, the conversation that my guitar player and i were having was the last show that we did was in queens new york at a place called the footlight and it is an awesome venue is there's in that little part of queens it's very very organically community driven by a bunch of like art people it's very artsy like people who just all music, all art, all mediums. They're like a couple bar owners, you know, who have like vintage pinball and shit like that. That is That's very, so dope. yeah, it sounds sort of hipstery, 
but um but it, that it was that community and uh when we booked that show when we got there uh well, I should maybe rewind. Before we booked the show, when I was in communication with that venue, the Footlight, they were just kind of like, yeah, just uh, set up the show and we'll run it. Just find some locals. And I'm just like, I have to find locals. I live in fucking Ohio. <laughs> right. I have to find some Queens and New York area locals. But the magic of the DIY community, even on an online presence, uh, we... I had people who were like, listen to our music and was like, fuck yeah, let's get on this. And so I was able to get some, some bands who were fucking awesome. And I, and I, I love those bands that played so much. Um, and they agreed to it. And so I said, all right, bet, run it to the venue owner. And she was like, all right, call, awesome. Just show up. So our show was on Super Bowl Sunday. Oh, wow. Palindrome day. Plus, they were doing a chili competition in lieu of the uh, a chili a chili cookoff in lieu of the Super Bowl. And then before the show happened, there was a private séance that happened in the venue room. Like this, if this is what kind of place this was. And so we get there, it's and a variety show, right? <laughs> we get there, and essentially they were kind of like, okay. Uh, you just kind of figure out when people play and kind of they put the show on us like we had to, essentially we booked the show we bought we put on the bands and then it was on us to manage the bands create when people are playing when and essentially be stage managers all the while playing the show and on one hand people think oh man that sounds stressful me and eric were talking that was fucking awesome there was like this real cool togetherness that ourselves and the bands that were playing and their friends that they brought. I mean, the show itself on turnout was not very successful. The venue broke even. We had like maybe 30 people there at the end of the night, you know. But the people that were there, it had that that community energy of like, we all, we all did this. We did this. And it reminded me so much of that energy that we should have back at home. We did this. I love that. Yeah, we fucking did this. And, and, my, and my buddy Eric is, is super passionate about it. He's like, we drove out to fucking Queens, New York on Super Bowl Sunday, on Palindrome Day, grabbed a handful of local bands, and we're like, fuck it. Let's go. And we did it. We fucking did it. What was the uh, – besides? so besides, like, the tri- like, some of the obvious logistics, what was the uh, toughest part of that show besides, like – trying to get bands together, trying to travel and get their like, what was like probably the, the most difficult part. The only difficult part was sort of deciding who went where, as far as the uh, bill order, because all of them were kind of local. We were from out of state. So we had to have a kind of prime spot because, you know, one, we kind of booked the show and then two, we need to have, you know, the most money made honestly because we're you know damn near a thousand miles from home we need a little help especially that pennsylvania turnpike right i don't want to fucking talk about it <laughs> <laughs> no dude i've i've been through that i've uh i've been to new york city and new jersey and like philadelphia and like and they'll Pittsburgh. surprise you you'll get a, you'll get a notice in the mail saying hey by the way you owe us uh you know 25 dollars why why because you crossed the bridge once yeah actually i i had to i went to pittsburgh um in late late february and i got a letter from like the pennsylvania turnpike whatever of like you gotta pay this like 12 dollar thing i'm like what the fuck? what because i wanted to go take a piss somewhere all right yeah because yeah because well, yeah, as you get deeper into the state it's like 17 dollars at toll or mm-hmm. whatever but uh no that's capitalism so that, ca- capitalism but uh, <sighs> that's no. why i feel i feel you with that travel stuff Right, but other than that, but like, even making a bill order wasn't stressful inherently because people were cool. They were like, "No, we don't care," you know. I'd, well, people would be like, "I prefer to do this," but like, I'm down with whatever. And so, what made it complicated was the pressure we put on ourselves because we we didn't want to insult anybody. We're the new guys in town going like, "You you guys don't even fucking know who we are." 
because and also truthfully you're kind of looking ban- looking at bands at like the same level it's like i don't care who goes yeah literally it was it was drawing straws and so we just sort of went how we did it was we asked um how long of sets do people have you know and that's that's all that's always a big question like we've dealt with the other bands deal with because it's like you don't want to travel somewhere and play only like 15 20 minutes like you want the time there to be worth it right and well the one of the bands was like we only have about 20 minutes of material all right you can go first like instantly like get it in there and get it done right you know and then like the other bands like well we're gonna go a little longer and then there was one band of like hey we have a lot of material and also they just put out a new record so they want to promote that yeah so i'm like okay you guys can headline because they were actually also more local you know i'm like yeah you guys you brought you know a lot of your friends you're putting out a record you just released it today or something like that or like it was like a couple days before mm-hmm. you know so it, it sort of solved itself you know so at the end of the day did we make a money from it not really we sold like a couple cds and a shirt you know and but it reminded me so much of like the, how i wish shit was at back back at home and it's possible and, we can do that and it's really funny how like you know that was probably like a 10 11 12 hour drive from Toledo to New York City. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things where it's like you go to a different part of the country. Most of the time, people have the same mentality or like the the drive, especially musicians. It's like mm-hmm. what they're doing in Queens, New Jersey, Kent. It's like those bands and venues that just want to play and display music. They just, they just want to put on shows. They just want to. It. That's the DIY community to me. That that right there encompassed everything. That whole adventure of like booking shows and connecting with people emailing people talking with people then actually playing the shows and then talking with the people there Mm -hmm. and you know making friends with people that's that's what i feel the diy community here maybe strives strives for and you know tries to aim for but i feel with a lot of the fluff a lot of shit like this a lot of the petty competitive shit Mm-hmm. It gets lost. And I think sort of the message of this podcast, um, I really want to be just sort of like, we need to abandon all that shit and, you know, really abandon this idea of gatekeeping, you know, and sort of like the things that Summit Shack does greatly, let's, you know, adopt these things and or um, endorse these things. Um, and, you know, for example, Paul House sees things that Summit Shack's doing great. Hey, it's not a competition. Hey, you mm-hmm. can do those same things, you know, and then something that Holland House does, does great. Summit Shack can adopt, you know, it's not, you know, there's no need to be like, I own this way of social media, you know, social media ing, you know, no one, no one owns it. They no, own, one, no one owns they, it. They own us. If we think about it, they own us. Right. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they own us. Oh, that's another podcast, but it is so we, we so should what you're kind of where you're kind of going with is it's like you want it, i think i touched on it earlier it's like we ultimately want them to you know be in better each other reasons and then also to inspire each exactly. other That's, iron sharpening iron you're both making buttered toast back to butter toast back to butter toast i don't give a flying fuck if it's butter side up butter side down all y'all motherfuckers are making buttered toast I love, how, I love how i'm talking directly into the camera you motherfuckers out there, Summit Shack, Holland House, everybody, you know, and again, not even pointing at the venue owners, because I think, honestly, at this point, the people who run both venues are probably figuring shit out right now as we speak. This is also going to go out to the people in our area who uh, are drawing lines in the sand mm-hmm. and saying, if you fucking support them, you're a fucking piece of shit or vice versa. No. Bullshit. Let's just cut it out. Let's get back to the basics of, I really like going back to the, how you said of just like, here's the basics. And one of the base, basic fundamental pool, uh, rules here is make sure everything's cool. Let's just be chill. Let's play some shows. Absolutely. You know? And kind of, kind of go back to earlier with like this, you know, there's like new, you know, this younger generation coming up or whatever you want to call it. Like the social media generation social media has shown us that we can literally do whatever we want. Like right. think of how, think of how much music you've seen released or that you listen to that artists can just 
independently record, produce, and release without any kind of record label or management representation. Uh, that's most of the scene in Toledo. No one here has a manager or almost none of us are on any kind of record label, whatever. It's like mm -hmm. we're all paying for the recording ourselves one way or another, whether it's out of our pockets or we do shows and sell merch to put that money towards recording. Right. And, and that's another thing. You don't have to go to a big time studio in Detroit, Los Angeles, New York City, Nashville. There's a ton of the thing about DIY, it's anything now, because like think about how many independently owned um, recording studios there are in Toledo, where it's already got how many, how many, I guarantee you every, every single band at one point in time or every musician in Toledo at one point in time has recorded one song, an EP or an album in some dude's basement. And <laughs> yeah, so DIY just kind of, and like the internet has proved that to us and technology recording technology has proved that to be able, proved that to be able to do so. Right. And with these venues, it's like social media. It's like, okay, well, here's the address here. Are the band's playing date and time cost, if there is any and bam. So it's social media has taught everybody to be DIY because we can be totally self self-sufficient without record labels, managers, um, I think publicists are still important and I'm actually, mm -hmm. and I'm actually, uh, I'm currently doing an apprentice, apprenticeship of being a publicist. Cause I see that kind of lacking in our area right. because there's enough people running venues or running studios. So I'm working on being a publicist. Hell yeah. Um, Cause I'm just all about giving bands right and artists their recognition and like getting people to know it. So that's another conversation. Um, so it's just it's just funny how like people are just learning they can do everything themselves now. And what's funny is like kind of going back to like when the, the local promoter innovation shut down for a bit and it reopened back up in 2016. That's when ICM really became like you know a regular in the scene in terms of playing these venues and like being older in the scene kind kind of. And you can agree when like bands came back at that 2016 like mark that mid 2016 mark um i don't know if i'm making sense at this point there's like a ton of new bands and a ton of new like just different people in the scene and a lot of younger whoops uh i had this ready to go whenever but um i can just tell around that time just when there's a generational shift in like how to approach local music and being a local musician uh, yeah i didn't think of that but yeah that, that timeline makes sex make 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 sex i wish <laughs> lonely uh but no, it makes sense. That, um, so that, 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 that timeline definitely works. So, and it'll be kind of, so what I'm really curious to see is like, uh, you know, like with this pandemic right now, a lot of people, no, I mean, shout out to anybody who's doing live streams. I know you've done some yourself done couple, and yeah. you've done a couple, we've done a couple, a lot of people are doing some, uh, and a lot of these venues are sponsoring their own, like, live stream i know holland house has done it i'm pretty holland sure House, summer shack literally yep. fucking uses minecraft <laughs> yeah I to do that's shows dope. that's and using to people are getting creative this is amazing shit that everybody should get on board on mm -hmm. there's no fucking copyright on it this this is a iron sharpening iron shit gang exactly. and what so what, what stop I'm really fucking around <laughs> so what i'm really interesting exactly and i feel like as you've known, every scene, every couple of years, something major happens or something changes. And I think when we come from this, and this isn't just DIY venues, it's just like local music or music in general, because you better believe I, there's gotta be people working on some amazing shit right now. And uh, whether they're gonna release it now or they're gonna release it like when they can do shows again so they can promote it, like kind of a little better because you can play those songs live. But uh, right. I'm really interested in, I think there's just gonna be a lot of new stuff, new bands, and hopefully some new positive mentalities when, and we all, no one knows the timeline, but when bars and restaurants can be a thing again and have people, and then when bands can do regular shows again, I see a lot of, I'm, I guarantee there's gonna be a lot of new faces, new bands, and like, or there's gonna be, and it's gonna be the same thing. Like there's gonna be bands who've just been 
working hard at what they do when they come back they're just like miles beyond what they've been able to do and i hope it's i hope huge, the same man us. but let's let's kind of end on on this note um of just like i do i do i have one more thing i apologize and dude, go I, ahead <laughs> i know right but uh i guess the big thing i want i kind of want to sum up with is like i want you know like you kind of got this thing between the two venues right now and everybody's trying to survive right now in this mm-hmm. particularly unique time and like i would hate to see someone go down or both go down you know because of this and um i don't know if i'm making sense but we all kind of have to like be cool with each other and to survive there in this time and support each other because it's just fucking hard no matter, exactly no matter which way possible so if anything i just want literally people to like you know put aside whatever and that's easier said than done and to further venues to inspire and to inspire each other and to hopefully once things come back up, both venues and all venues are just ready to like embrace all of these musicians, bar, bar patrons, and like just concert goers and music fans just to like have a good time. And especially if a lot of people are working on stuff right now. And because I can only imagine people who were literally about to start a band or literally about to do their first show and then all this shit happened. So it's like, yeah, the bands need these spots to be able to express themselves in a public setting. And the only way at this point, really the only way we're going to be able to have any of these venues exist after like the pan, all this pandemic. So if we just look out for each other and to not bring anybody down. So I just kind of want to, you know, if I wanted to sum myself up with my opinion on everything, I just kind of want to be like that. Cause I mean, Perfect. yeah. No, that, like, yeah, that, that's, and kind of one of the, of the previous points in uh, the, or previous points that you were, were mentioning with that was when, when we finally come emerge from out of this, you know, people are going to have not only <clears throat> t- time to have perfected their craft even more. So there's going to be a lot. I've written like almost fucking 12 damn near new songs. That's since awesome. doing this. You know, like just like, there's a lot of ideas bubbling. I can't wait to get the band practice, you know, like there. I think this whole thing has created a new uh, appreciation or hopefully will create, I should say, will create a new appreciation for when we can get back to doing what we were doing. 100%. And I think, um, like you said, if anybody needs to spend their time wisely, other than being cool with each other, you know, work on your instrument, work on your craft. And I think a big thing people need to be doing right now is networking and like literally talking to different bands and different, because I've been talking to a lot of guys throughout the scene that I not that I wouldn't talk to regularly, but I'm talking to them now more than ever um, right. for one reason or another. Like, you, you know, you and I have been talking pretty recently and I've, yeah. you know, and I've always uh, looked up to you and appreciate everything you've done for the scene. You as a dude and <laughs> you're, you're funny as shit, man. And um, I appreciate, I appreciate you as a guy, man. And um, so I definitely, I just think people just need to be networking and especially during this time, kind of going back to the DIY thing, yeah. Um, if you're looking to play in different cities, try and make some friends, like musician friends in other cities. We I got, saw, we got, we got the resources. We got the fucking internet. For example, ex- Fuck. 100%, for example, I saw, I'm, I'm a part of one group. I think it's just a general DIY touring post page on Facebook. Um, uh-huh. I saw this girl who was like, Hey, I'm moving to the Baltimore area. Um, I'm just trying to like make connections for like, you know, like when things can like open back up again i want to play with people so at this time she was trying to network and i'm like that's a beautiful thing to do right now um, genius so and i'm sure I that think, post got a lot of hits oh absolutely like, people just like tagging like the different baltimore like bands or artists and you can do that with any city because like like for me personally perfect uh, dude for me personally i made a connection well this was like a year or two ago with uh this artist out in seattle um what she does is super fucking cool. Her name's uh, Dre, and she her band's uh, Dre in the Maryland's. Um, so it's it's cool talking to someone on a completely different part of the country, and like particularly Seattle's hit really hard with the virus early on. So just being like, hey, I've heard what's in the news. So like, what's really happening in like Seattle? Because from Toledo or, or from Ohio, this is what we're hearing. And so, right. and also just 
not only connecting as like musicians, but just being like, how you, how, how you hold that, is everything cool? Because every state is handling this differently, even though it's like a completely unified thing throughout the whole country. Right. So, um, yeah. Talk to people, people. We got to... We got the shit, man. We we got the shit. We can we have the means and I, and I I've always been somebody who has tried to steer clear of the of the uh the usual cheese ball sort of uh mottos and stuff like that or, mm-hmm. or mentalities, but this has been like a two and a half hour podcast essentially to say stop being fucking wieners and let's just be cool (laughs) because the goal is the same let's better each other you know those who support either venue and this goes across to anybody in any format in any medium in art you know there's always going to be an arms race competition is healthy but put the bullshit aside put the drama aside let's better each other from it you know and who will be on literally be unstoppable what literally a couple fucking doughy white guys from <laughs> fucking midwest northwest ohio through the diy community and people's kindness were able to f- piece together something that we're going to walk away with you know remembering for a lifetime so everybody has that power we just got to utilize it that being said uh, um, I know you got quite a few things that, um, I'm sure you want to plug. So go ahead and I'm going to give the floor to you. Plug all the things you want to plug and then we'll say our, our goodbyes and we'll see you next time. But Tanner, give me some plugs. Give me some stuff. What are you doing? Sounds good. Um, cur- currently laid off, but I think I actually got my unemployment uh, approved. So one, money is about to start coming in again. So I'm really stoked about that um our creative note um i ice cream militia we're just trying to we're, we're still kind of trying to figure out ways to get creative during this time we've done a couple live streams we put up uh some music video like one music video up of one of our older songs we're just we're working on another one that we like to release another one yeah another, another one uh we like to release that hopefully in a couple of weeks um just try and figure that out and you know we, like i said we've been trying to like write song like keep writing songs mm-hmm. and like just sharing ideas back and forth um i personally got something that i've been pretty stoked about um if you like funk which yes um so well there's a lot of just it's also just been nice to like genuinely spend time with my guitar by myself uh and just to like make sure what i'm doing it makes me feel good and then when we get into a band setting again it'll be I'll be able to contribute confidently. Hell yeah. That's how we all feel. And then um, I consider myself a part-time comedian. Um, I started doing stand-up comedy in January, 30 OT. So shout out to uh, the Ottawa Tavern, as always. Um, Ryan, Ryan Chernick is a great dude. And he's been hosting the open mic nights. And uh, it's just something I've always wanted to do. And of course, it kind of took a pause because of the pandemic but uh i've been able to meet a lot of people and network in the comedy community in toledo and oh yeah dude we got some funny ass people and um i'm trying to figure out ways to get them noticed a couple of these people have like actual like albums or like recordings of themselves that they've released doing comedy and New I'm shit. Trying, yeah so i'm trying to figure out ways to like one perfect myself as a comedian but also like people need to hear this shit and Shout out the Ottawa Tavern and other venues around Toledo, like Grumpy Dave's and BG and uh, um, Manhattan's in downtown Toledo and uh, what's the other place? Home Slice Pizza for having open mic nights because we don't really have much of a comedy venue in Toledo anymore. I mean, we have the Funny Bone in Perrysburg, but that's like a chain thing. So we don't really have like a specific comedy club for like yeah. local or regional. So if anybody's trying to open up a comedy club, you know what's up. Um, so I've been just trying to like work on some comedy stuff. Um, it's really hard to know if jokes are funny or not. Cause it's not really much of an audience to like, bounce it <laughs> you off don't of. have that energy of bombing or not. <laughs> like I will like some, some, I've seen some comedians do some live streams and like, that's really cool. I just, I'm just 
it's just too vulnerable for me at the moment, especially if yeah. I'm very new. So it's like, I'm not trying to tell dick jokes on Facebook Live. And then my uncle is like, ooh. <laughs> you know, so, what are um, you doing? So I'm just trying to, you know, work on my own material as I go, just oh, yeah. ideas and piece them in, piecing them together. And then other than that, um, kind of like I said, I'm working on being a publicist, uh, just really help bands get known. I've been work. I worked with a couple artists. Uh, one in Nashville, another in Nashville, and then one in Pittsburgh. Um, so I'm doing some stuff with. So um, we'll see how that goes. And then the last thing, uh, I started a podcast of my own because another white guy with a beard and glasses who drinks IPAs with a podcast. What? Fuck. Um, so that's called Tanner Time with Tanner Words. It's very much based off of like I love the. It's a combination. I like what Joe Rogan and Bill Burr and Joey Diaz do. It's just like taking a subject and just kind of rolling with it. Um, yeah, and, just, and plus, turning the record button and just going and just going, just ripping. Ex- exactly. So like each of my episodes, if well, I've, I have three episodes so far, um, they've only been like twenty or thirty minutes long each. Um, the last one, the last episode I just released, I talked about the incident where I became famous for a weekend when I played guitar at the Steak and Shake. Oh, yeah, you're the Steak and Shake guy. Yeah, so uh, I talked about that um, because that was when the Steak and Shakes shut down because of, like, hella health code violations. And someone's like, let's have a vigil at the Monroe Street one. Like, people having candles and, like, the news crew came. And I I just came to play guitar just to be entertaining. And over that weekend, everybody was sharing sharing my picture. I was in that meme where it was, like, Toledo in four pictures so like for a weekend I was on the same level as the Christmas weed so I'm not like Jamie Park Katie Holmes famous I'm just below Christmas weed mm-hmm. famous so I talk about that in my podcast but at the same time it's kind of I'm in the same boat as you where it's like I'm trying to entertain myself but at the same time like I can call my, I can call myself a dumbass too and like I just want to learn and because I eventually want to have like people on I'd love to have you on sometime and uh there wanted to be some episodes where I'm talking and somewhere I want other people to talk, but I'm just kind of like, you know, having the quality control, kind of like what you did with me having on. Uh, and just kind of like let the show be whatever it is. So it can just, it's just uh, Tanner Time with Tanner Words. So Tanner Time Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. I think I, sh- I might as well make it Twitter because I didn't know if it was going to be good enough for Twitter, but I see it's Fuck working. Fuck it, dude. Go all, it. all bases. Uh, so and, and it's on iTunes, Spotify, Google, so all your podcast apps. Because um, I definitely still want to do it even after the quarantine, after the pandemic. So, oh, yeah. but it's like of all time to do it. So I want I want to ask you real quick: How long have you been thinking about this podcast? This is this was an idea that's been ongoing for the, actually a couple of years, but it took a fucking pandemic to actually just come come into fruition and figure out technology slightly that's how i feel too i hear you but anything I, anything cool with uh grubby paws coming in uh just we're writing me and eric are writing a bunch of fucking songs jake is still an essential worker um jimmy's just chilling <laughs> uh he's he's w- working on stuff with his other bands um but you know eric and i are accumulating a bunch of material um and we will be figuring that out once we're able to you know not give each other space aids uh when we get into a room together so um on that note i wanted to, i wanted to leave on that note on so many previous notes but tanner this has been fucking fun and i, I do have one question and i feel it's the most pressing question because you reminded me that on the new episode of tanner time tanner time podcast that available everywhere you can stream online uh, when you were the steak and shake guy, you were a meme. Okay, T- technically you were a meme. Below Christmas weed, but you were for a minute internet famous. Did you get any any you know folks in your DMs trying to smash because of of internet fame? Did you smash? No. Damn. All right. But to be fair, I was dating someone at the time. So people are very respectful of that. Oh. So it's like I was, but like. Now, okay. 
when you were dating that person at the time. When you became a little more internet famous, did the did, did, this was the slam time a little bit more, a little bit more powerful because you had a little bit of fame on you. You're maybe maybe doing a couple flexes while you're pumping. I felt pretty good, man. <laughs> you felt I, pretty good, yeah. All right. I felt I I felt good. It's like <laughs> it's I'm just kind of like it, it's just it's just I looked at her. I'm just like you know who I am, right? <laughs> Steak and shake guy. No, all jokes aside, it was very much just like her texting me like, "LOL, you're a meme." I'm just like, <laughs> or it was like, "LOL, my parents saw it." Um, the one, the one cool thing I got out of it though was what's funny is that Steak and Shake on Monroe Street briefly reopened like a month or two afterwards, mm-hmm. and I was with a couple of friends, and I was because I was just like, "Yo, we gotta go!" Like it was, it was the move because like that Monroe Street one because growing up in Pennsylvania that was the one I went to like yeah. in high school and college it's just cheap 24 hours you know how it goes and uh, I'm normally I'm normally not like this at all but I when uh, the waitress came up to us I think towards the end I was just like hey I just want to give you guys a fun fact remember that guy who was playing guitar uh, when this place was closed down she was like yeah I was like, it was me and I showed the picture like it was just the one. Normally, it's just like, hey, fun fact. You flexed. You flexed I, on her. Yeah, I hit. In the moment, it seemed like a good idea, but what I was actually type was like normally a steak and shake. They give you your bill, just like all the seats bills, just like in one. Gave the entire, the entire uh, table fifty percent off because of that, and like. Because of Tanner time. The one time I'll ever do that, I'll. I won't go be bouncing around steak and shakes trying to get discounts, but I was just like, I've seen, it? I've seen a lot of people. I've seen a lot of old memes do that shit. I'm sure Tay Zonde is fucking out there, you know, going to fucking Denny's and just going, you, do you know who I am? <laughs> I yeah, was the I chocolate it's... rain guy. Go fuck yourself. You're not getting free pancakes. <laughs> Absolutely. So if a, if anything of uh, 15 minutes or a weekend of fame, I got that. So like, oh, yeah. I'm totally satisfied. And Honestly, sometimes, sometimes some, uh, some 50% off steak and shake better than getting ass. All right. As long, as long, <laughs> as, long, as, long as, as long as it benefited who I was with. Um, absolutely. And like, so like I said, it was just something to talk about in an episode. And if I have the platform and want to talk about it, cool, whatever. And you're here with your platform talking to me about whatever. So, and I, pre- I really, exactly, and I super appreciate you uh, reaching out to me and like having this. This has been, yeah, going on two and a half hours, but dude, it's been so much fun. Thank you. Woo! This is gonna be a whopper. I really appreciate you having me, man. Appreciate you. I appreciate anybody who's made it this far. <laughs> been a lot of ramblings, a lot of, a lot of fucking shitty white guy opinions. But remember, these are our opinions. There are many like it, but this one is our, these these ones are our own. Take care of each other. Don't develop drinking habits. Whoops. Whoops. Until next time. Bye. <laughs>